My presence here is merely ornamental, <laughs> and thus I will be brief. Uh, I just want to say basically uh, why uh, we think that uh, the Marine Service and Mercator is a crown jewel in the, uh, in the services portfolio of Copernicus. And then maybe a few words about uh, what's cooking uh, on, the, on the Copernicus and space policy front in general. So, you know, in, in those type of welcoming words, it's, it's customary to, if you like, sugarcoat the message and say why the uh, inviting institution is the best in the world. But I think it's actually impossible to do otherwise for the, uh, for the marine service uh, specifically here. Um, it's, you know, whoever asked before uh, uh, presenting here and uh, basically my briefing is full of praise. So I think all the, all the comments we got from the colleagues in the two units working on Copernicus and the Commission were extremely positive and I also benefited immensely from uh, Pierre and, and Cecilia visiting me early on in my mandate and, and if you like, um, organizing a, uh, a type of a coaching session for uh, Mercator for the uninitiated, so that was very helpful as well. In essence, why I think this is um, a crown jewel in the services portfolio is because I think uh, the, uh, the marine service is actually hitting the sweet spot between on the one hand being a commercially driven and demand responsive segment, and on the other hand being really at the forefront of scientific inquiry. And I think this, this combination is actually the essence of the blue economy, and I think it's extremely welcome and definitely a best practice. So on the commercial side, uh, needless to say, the, the word mercator obliges, because I guess it means merchant in Latin, so you're also very demand-driven. And I think uh, the uptake service of Mercator has been really a best practice across the services. Uh, I'm told that you have you know, up to 500 new users a month, which is kind of impressive, uh, that you're organizing surveys yourself, and those surveys are giving you extremely high scores, which is, which is uh, equally uh, amazing, that the help desk is really a, a state-of-the-art. Uh, that you run those very interesting first contract uh, demonstration type of uh, devices for uh, the new applications, and that you cooperate with many uh, other institutions like EARSC, but not only. I think what is extremely valuable is that, that you often transgress the space silo. I think this is very interesting for us, especially as you go downstream in the value chain of Copernicus services, that uh, that the services do not only stay within the so-called traditional space silo, but uh, reach out to others, which is extremely important with the big data, artificial intelligence, and other applications, which is developing so, so rapidly. And of course, uh, your cooperation with the DIASs, which is you know, our babies, if you like, uh, in terms of uh, the creation recently, is extremely, extremely uh, useful. Equally on the scientific front, so when I talk about the crossroads, uh, the, uh, the cutting edge scientific contributions are well known to the market. Uh, there is the coastal, the architecture, the, the aquaculture, but uh, I think quite, uh, quite impressively also the Arctic elements. I mean, we have quite a big focus on the Arctic in general, but specifically also uh, uh, still this year. I think we have uh, plenty high level events. So we have one in Brussels, one in Umea, Reykjavik, and then we have this space week in December. So there is quite a big focus on the Arctic, and I think your, uh, your attention given to the, to the area is extremely valuable. So again, a sweet spot and a crossroads between commercial and scientific. And I think uh, it, in a way, defies the, the typical economic textbook assumption that you know, a, a public good uh, can be, uh, cannot be efficiently delivered. I think this public good is very efficiently delivered by an organization which is cutting edge and not solely profit driven, which I think is, is extremely valuable and interesting. So then maybe a few words a little bit about the broader context uh, in which the, uh, the commission works on, on Copernicus, my unit together with the other unit of, of Mauro uh, working on, on Copernicus. So in essence, as you know, we're entering uh, the negotiations uh, in the multi-annual financial framework. These are usually difficult, they're always difficult. This time, of course, we have to wait for the new, uh, for the new parliament to have it completed. So we might be you know, facing constraints and choices, but this is, this is well understood and this is uh, undergoing. We'll know a bit more depending on what happens on, 
on the, on Sunday. So you know, do 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 vote on Sunday in a responsible European way. I think the more responsible European those choices will be, the smoother the ride is going to be towards the towards the uh, uh, end of the year. Uh, as you might also know, we have uh, now a draft of what we call uh, a single space regulation. So basically, we're bringing together Galileo and Copernicus. This is a bit of a novelty and experiment. We, we see how this baby survives the, uh, the, the, new, the new parliament again, because that's just a draft which was adopted uh, provisionally. But again, the parliament has to finally approve it. That, that actually, that new space regulation also is a, is a bit of a harbinger of the fact that the Commission, as a program manager, will be trying to seek, to the extent possible, synergies between Galileo and Copernicus. So, of course, the services are essentially different, but as you go downstream in terms of uptake, in terms of communications, in terms of applications, I mean, the more synergies that are created, I think the more uh, successful those two will be uh, in, in, in tandem. Uh, there's also uh, increasingly a new role for the EU agency in Prague, which is uh, so far traditionally been dealing with uh, Galileo, but there will be some Copernicus-related tasks in, in Prague as well, in line with at least what is currently in the draft uh, regulation. Uh, and last but not least, I think we're also having reflections at the moment, only reflections, and Pierre was there in the Copernicus committee, but about the data policy, the free, full, and open data policy. I mean, this was traditionally the first commandment in Copernicus, and I think it's likely to be remaining uh, the case. But I think we're increasingly in a, in a kind of a trade context, which is becoming uh, interesting in the context of huge success Copernicus has had. That is to say, after all, this is a program which is paid by taxpayers' money, and it's always been driven by science. But I think our paymasters increasingly ask the question, are we really sure that the bulk of the value added remains in Europe, and actually the taxpayers are getting a fair return. So I think those questions you will see increasingly being analyzed. Again, primarily this is a scientific program, but the questions of jobs and growth and, you know, and how much of the data is actually uh, uh, consummated and exploited and leveraged in Europe on the European territory for the sake of European taxpayers and uh, for the welfare of European uh, citizens as consumers, employees, employers increasingly going to be asked. So these are the, the kind of three high level issues which we see on the horizon. So the second half of the year is going to be pretty interesting. Uh, again, uh, I'm wishing you a uh, successful uh, assembly. I see the agenda is extremely packed. So the, the crown jewel is going to be feather polished, which of course is always, always possible. But uh, but otherwise, uh, all the best and thanks so much for the great work.